Hi, I'm Schaefer Bader. I'm an endocrinologist and diabetes specialist. And today we're gonna to be talking about type two diabetes. So if you have pre-diabetes, if you're recently diagnosed with type two diabetes, or if you've had type two diabetes for a long time, but wanna kinda of get back to the basics, this is the talk for you. We're gonna be covering what type two diabetes is. We're gonna be talking about treatments for type two diabetes, including diet and exercise. And we're gonna talk about some ways that you can monitor your own blood glucose at home. So without further ado, let's get into it. So what is type two diabetes and why me? Like why do some people get this? So it's a, it's a complicated question and the short answer is we don't know all the details, but what we do know is that it has to do with the way your body uses insulin. Insulin helps your body use glucose, that's its main job. When your body becomes resistant to the effects of insulin, it can't use the glucose well. Your body is unable to absorb that glucose and put it in the places it's supposed to be. So the glucose stays in your bloodstream and that's why you get high blood sugar. So in short, type two diabetes is from insulin resistance. That's the main driver of type two diabetes. And there's also a contribution from relative insulin deficiency. So that's when your, your body's making insulin but it can't make enough to keep up with the insulin resistance to get your blood sugar down where it wants to be. Insulin resistance and insulin deficiency kind of come from a combination of genetic and environmental factors. So genetic factors are very strong in type two diabetes. So if you have type two diabetes, you can in part thank your parents for it. It really runs in families. But the environmental factors includes things like what we eat, what's your weight, um, you know, do you have exercise? These are all important components that, that move your risk for type two diabetes. How do we actually diagnose type 2 diabetes? Well, there's a few different tests that we can use, but I'm just gonna focus on two of them that are the most common. The first, I think, and the most easiest to understand is just what is your blood sugar? So we use a fasting blood sugar. What is your blood sugar first thing in the morning when you haven't eaten anything overnight? If that blood sugar is above 126, then that suggests that you may have diabetes. A normal blood sugar in someone who doesn't have diabetes would be expected to be less than 100 when fasting. Now another really common test that many of you may have heard of is the glycosylated hemoglobin or A1C. So the A1C test gives us an idea of what your blood sugar might be over an average of two to three months. So that, that average blood sugar over the past two to three months. And the higher the, the A1C percent, the higher your average blood sugar has been. Again, someone who doesn't have diabetes, we'd expect an, an A1C to be less than 5.7. But if that A1C number creeps up and it gets above 6.4, so in other words, 6.5 or higher, that's consistent with type two diabetes. Now there's a range in between there. So between 5.7 and 6.4% on the A1C is considered pre-diabetes. And pre-diabetes means you probably have some insulin resistance, but it hasn't advanced to full diabetes. And you may not ever advance to full diabetes. Some people don't. And the way to reduce your risk of advancing from pre-diabetes into diabetes is through lifestyle modifications primarily. So that's things like improving your diet and finding a way to lose weight and kind of maintain a lower body weight over time to help that insulin resistance. Just real briefly, this is how A1C and blood glucose compare. Okay, so if you know what your last A1C is, you can look at this chart and get an idea of what your average blood sugar is. And if your A1C is, for example, seven, which is a good A1C for people who have diabetes, then that, that matches up with an average blood glucose of around 150, okay? So, so this is just kind of an idea to get you oriented to how those numbers relate to each other. All right, so why do we care about diabetes? Why do we care about blood sugars at all? Well, we know that type two diabetes can increase your risk for all sorts of bad things. Okay, I'm not gonna spend a bunch of time talking about the bad things, but they include heart disease, cardiovascular disease, also kidney disease, we call that nephropathy, vision problems or retinopathy, which is damage to the retina in the back of the eye, and nerve problems or neuropathy. So these are examples of complications from diabetes that we want to prevent. So if we can improve blood glucose control, then we can reduce the risk of having any of these bad complications. So that's why we care, that's what we're all here for. Let's talk a little bit about heart disease and diabetes because diabetes does increase the risk of heart disease. We sometimes frame this as the A, B, C, D, E's of heart care in diabetes. So A stands for A1C, right? That's your blood sugar control. That's really important for reducing the risk of heart problems in diabetes. We also sometimes put aspirin on that A list. Um, aspirin therapy can be important for reducing the chance of heart problems in certain individuals. And that's something to talk to your doctor about. 
B stands for blood pressure control. Blood pressure is one of the major drivers of heart disease, so make sure your blood pressure is at goal. Same with cholesterol, right? So sometimes we use medications like statins or PCSK9 inhibitor medications to lower the bad cholesterol LDL and to help raise the good cholesterol HDL. D is for diabetes medications that help protect the heart. And we'll be talking more about those. They're really important. They're tools that we use all the time in type 2 diabetes. And E stands for eliminate smoking. We know smoking is very bad for the heart. Let's talk about some essential diabetes-related screening. And this kind of relates to some of these other complications of diabetes and high blood sugars over time. The first is retinopathy. So we, you can screen your eyes to look for damage to the retina. And we do that with a dilated eye exam. That should be done when you're first diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and then every one to two years after that. We screen for nephropathy or kidney damage using kidney function and urine tests where we look for protein. Again, should be done at diagnosis and then every year after. And then finally, neuropathy, looking for nerve damage, uh, that should be done looking with a foot exam and sensation testing, again at diagnosis and every year thereafter. So just kind of a reminder that these are important parts of diabetes care. And certainly during the COVID pandemic, a lot of these things were pushed to the wayside because people weren't getting to the doctor as much. Some of the visits were telemedicine. Some of these things got forgotten. So if you're behind on these screenings or you've never had them and you have diabetes, now's the time to call your doctor and say, hey, I think I need to get some of my screenings done. All right, so what about treating type 2 diabetes? How do we actually improve your blood glucose and your health? Well, of course, we use medications. We'll be talking about some of those medications today. It's something that we doctors talk about all the time, but we can't forget about how important diet is as well as exercise and physical activity, and also the ability for you to monitor your own blood glucose and follow that so you know what's going on with your own blood sugar. So let's get into it. Let's talk about diet, all right? Now, first of all, there's not really such a thing as a diabetic diet. The closest thing, in my opinion, though, is a low carbohydrate diet. So what's a carbohydrate? Carbohydrates are a type of nutrition uh, that when we eat it, our body turns it into sugar, okay? So sugar actually is a type of carbohydrate, but there are many other carbohydrates that aren't sugar until we eat it. So it's a little confusing, but when you, when, when you think about a healthy diabetic diet, I want you to be thinking about carbohydrates and reducing the amount of carbohydrates that you're eating because those will turn into sugar. Carbohydrates come in things like tortillas and rice and uh, bread and pasta, right? So all these delicious carb things, okay? So the approach to a, a healthy diet for people with diabetes is to eat foods that you like, but in moderation. So you can still eat some carbohydrates, right? We don't expect you to completely cut out carbohydrates, but it's limiting the amount. So the goal is to limit those carbohydrates to a reasonable amount with each meal. And really that comes down to portion sizes, right? So reducing the, the, the portion sizes of those carbohydrates in your meals. And it's also a good idea to minimize snacks between meals that include carbohydrates, that contain carbohydrates, because that is gonna really help you maintain your blood sugar at goal. So what's a reasonable amount of carbohydrates per meal? So a good place to start would be to aim for 45 to 60 grams of carbs per meal. How much is that? So a good way to think about it is you can either use the grams of carbs, which is what you'll see on the back of a nutrition label, or you can think about it in terms of carb servings. And uh, we use 15 grams of carbs equals about one carb serving per meal. And you can have about three to four servings per meal if you want to target around 45 to 60 grams of carbs per meal, which again, I think is a good place to start. Some people might want more, some people might want less. So these are just some examples of one carb serving or 15 grams of carbs. So a single piece of bread, 10 Skittles, 10 French fries, a small piece of fruit, one third cup of pasta, which is about the size of a tennis ball, or my personal favorite, a half cup of ice cream. So these are just some examples. Now, if you wanna know how many carbs are in a specific food, sometimes that can be difficult, sometimes it's pretty easy. The first place to look is at the back of the nutrition label. Look for total carbohydrates. And you have to look at that and then see the serving size and then calculate how many carbs you're gonna eat of that food, whatever it is. Now some foods, if you're cooking at home, if you're eating out, become more difficult because they may not have a nutrition label. So one really good tool 
uh, for that is an app. So there's all sorts of different apps out there that can help you count carbs, keep track of your carbs, or find out how many carbs are in a specific food. These are just some examples, FigWe, MyFitnessPal, Calorie King. I'm not gonna get into the details of these, they're all a little bit different and they all offer some different features, but they're good options for figuring out how many carbs are in food. So if you're looking at carbs and trying to kind of keep a consistent amount of carbs with each meal and minimize carbs between meals, go check out these apps. So again, um, you know, reduce carbs between meals. So either zero carb or low carb snacks is a good approach. These are just some examples of delicious snacks that I like um, that don't have carbs in them or are very low in carbohydrates. And I think really importantly, when you're thinking about ways to reduce your carbohydrate intake and to improve your blood sugar is to not drink your carbs. And what I mean by that is if you drink regular soda, it's full of sugar, <clears throat> or you drink juice, there's a lot of sugar in that. If you can cut those out of your diet completely and switch over to zero carbohydrate drinks, it's gonna make a major difference in your blood sugars. And so that's not always easy, but it's a simple way to, to, to make one big change that can really improve your blood sugar. There's all sorts of great zero carbohydrate drinks out there. So just go try them, whether it's Crystal Light or Diet Soda or Gatorade Zero. Go to the store, look at them, check out the nutrition label, look for zero carbohydrates give it a shot and find some drinks that you really like. All right, moving on to exercise. So this is an important topic. Exercise is not the primary driver of your blood sugar, but it certainly contributes and it's an important part of your overall health. So the American Diabetes Association has some specific guidelines related to exercise and diabetes. They recommend 150 minutes or more of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic activity per week. Ideally spread over at least three days per week or even daily with no more than two consecutive days without activity. If you can, include two to three sessions per week of resistance exercise that helps to build muscle, keep you strong, and importantly, decrease time spent in sedentary behavior, right? That just means kind of sitting around not moving. Interrupt prolonged sitting every 30 minutes. This is something I have to work on because I'll get behind my desk and I'm doing work. Hours will pass and I haven't moved and I wake up, you know, I stand up stiff um, and that's because I need to move more. So try to move every 30 minutes. It's good for your body. If you aren't very active right now, but you want to become more active or you want to start doing some exercise, how do you kind of approach that? What's a good way to do that? Well, a good recommendation is to start low and go slow. In other words, don't jump into it 100% and expect to run a marathon next week, okay? Starting too aggressively can lead to injury, and plus it's probably not going to be sustainable. So a better approach is to set a goal that can't fail and then build on that success. Really sustainability is the key. So whether it's walking to your mailbox every day to get the mail or just taking the stair at work instead of taking the elevator, um, maybe it's going on a 15 or 20 minute walk every day after dinner, just set that goal and, and really stick with that first goal. Make it a habit, okay? So try exercising at the same time every day or making a schedule so that you can build in time for that physical activity. Otherwise, it can get pushed to the side and it doesn't really become part of your normal life. Finally, track your progress and celebrate your success, okay? And you may not get your, get your goal of exercise every single week. That's okay. Don't, don't let that uh, bring you down. Just remember that just doing some exercise is good. It's good for your body. It's good for your health. And this is a statement from the American Heart Association that I think um, is, is really powerful. They say the simplest positive change you can make to effectively improve your heart health is to start walking. It's enjoyable, free, easy, social, and great exercise. A walking program is flexible and boasts high success rates because people can stick with it. It's easy for walking to become a regular and satisfying part of life. So there's a lot of little pearls in that statement, but I really agree with that. So if you don't have other exercises that you have planned, Start walking, it's a really good way to do it. Okay, moving on to medications. So there's a ton of, of, of type two diabetes medications available out there. In fact, there's 12 classes of medications that we can use to help treat diabetes and improve your blood sugar. And in each of those classes, in most cases, there's many different medications. So there's a lot, but we're not gonna talk about every single medication, but to kind of walk through the history because I think it's interesting, interesting to see how far we've come. Insulin was the first diabetes medication. It was used first as a therapy in humans in 1922. Then many decades passed. Um, and you know, since then we've had developments in insulin where we have long acting insulin, rapid acting insulin, mixed insulin, and all types of different better insulins. The sulfonylureas were developed later on. These include medications like glipizide, glyburide, and glimepiride. These are still used frequently today 
They're good medications in that they lower your blood sugar, but they have their problems. They can cause hypoglycemia or low blood sugars that are too low, and they can also promote weight gain. So personally, not my favorite, but we still do use them in some cases. Uh, metformin was developed after that. Metformin um, is a great medication. And in fact, it really still forms the basis for our treatment for many people with type 2 diabetes. In recent decades, we've just had an explosion of different options and medications for type 2 diabetes, including Actos, which is pioglitazone, the GLP-1 receptor agonists like Trulicity and Ozempic, one called Wegovy that's actually specifically approved for weight loss, and the SGLT2 inhibitors like Farsiga and Jardians. And I've highlighted these two classes of medications because I'm going to be talking about them a little bit more because of their specific benefits for weight loss and protecting your heart. So GLP-1 is a natural hormone from your gut. It gets released when you eat, and it does many things around the body. But in short, it leads to lower blood sugars and decreased appetite. So it helps promote that weight loss and improve your blood sugars. There's many different GLP-1 receptor agonist medications available. Some of them are once a week injectables. Some of them are once a day, including a pill. But as a class, these medications lower the A1C. They improve your blood sugar. They promote weight loss. They do not cause low blood sugars or hypoglycemia, which is really important. And they protect against heart attacks and strokes. So the cardiologists, the heart doctors also really like these medications for that reason. The SGLT2 inhibitors make you pee out glucose. That's how they work. These are once a day pills and they, you end up peeing out the sugar right into your urine. So that's how it gets out of your body and it lowers your blood sugar. This is the amount of sugar that you pee out in one day with this, these medications working. So the SLT2 inhibitors also improve your blood sugars. They lower A1C. They also promote weight loss. They help blood pressure. They lower blood pressure a little bit. And they also do not cause low blood sugars. So also important, okay? They protect your heart. Um, and in particular, they work really well in people that have congestive heart failure, or CHF. They're really powerful medications for this. And again, the cardiologists, the heart doctors, love these medicines for people with CHF. They also do amazing things for the kidneys and help protect the kidneys against diabetic kidney disease. So the kidney doctors um, are frequently now prescribing these medications. These two classes of medicines are the first choice, often along with metformin, if you have heart disease, diabetic kidney disease, if you're overweight or obese, or if you're at risk for low blood sugars, like if you've had low blood sugars from other medications like sulfonylureas or insulin. There are some newer options like fixed ratio combination medications where there's a GLP-1 medicine plus a basal insulin. So you basically get two medicines in one injection per day. It's a really good option for people that are you know, requiring once a day insulin or basal insulin and would also like the GLP-1 benefit. Zoltify and Soliqua are the two options that contain both an insulin and a GLP-1 once a day shot. All the benefits. And lastly, let's talk a little bit about monitoring your blood sugar and knowing your glucose trends. This is important because you're the one who's living with diabetes every single day, right? So it's I'm sure your doctor is going to want to know how your blood sugars are doing, but how often do you see your doctor, right? You're the one who has this every day and is going to be making the day-to-day -day decisions. So you should know what your blood sugars are. To do so, we can use glucose meters. Obviously, these um, have you know, progressed a lot over time. They're small now, they're quick, they don't take a lot of blood, and they give you the power to know what's going on with your own blood sugar. So these are just some examples of glucose meters. Uh, if you don't have a blood glucose meter, I encourage you to get one. How often should you check? Well, if you're only on, for example, metformin or maybe another pill, and your A1C is at goal, let's say less than 7% or 6.5% or something like that, well then you don't need to check all the time. You can check occasionally just to know where your blood sugars are running and to make sure you're still on track. Now, if your A1C is not a goal, if it's too high and you're trying to bring it down, or if you're making medication adjustments, especially if you're using like a once a day basal insulin, then really you want to be checking your blood sugar at least once a day in the morning and sometimes later on throughout the day or at night so that you know what's going on with your blood sugar throughout the day. Um, if you're on multiple daily injections of insulin, right, so if you're giving insulin multiple times throughout the day or mealtime insulin, then really you need to be checking with each meal and at bedtime. And of course, you can check your blood sugar at any time. So if you don't feel well, for example, and you want to know, hey, do I have a high blood sugar or a low blood sugar? It's a good idea to check your blood sugar. What about continuous glucose monitors? We call these CGM. So uh, what is a CGM? First of all, a typical CGM system consists of a small sensor that's inserted under the skin. And it's basically a little tiny filament that sits right under the skin. You don't feel that it's there, but it's measuring the glucose every five minutes. 
And then that sensor sends, it to, sends this information to a wireless transmitter, which in turn sends the glucose information to a receiver. Now a receiver can be a little standalone device like a little pad, or it can just be your smartphone with an app that's receiving, storing, and processing all of this glucose information. So anytime you want to know your blood sugar, you can just look at the receiver or your smartphone app and see what your blood sugar is. Now these CGMs provide way more information than your A1C and your glucose meter can. Okay? As the name suggests, they give you continuous glucose data. So anytime throughout the day or night, if you want to know your blood sugar and you're wearing one of these, you can just take a look. It's going to be there. It's going to tell you what's going on. This ultimately, in addition just so that you know what's going on, it should support your decision making. It can help guide you in deciding, you know, uh, making changes in your diet, deciding what's good to eat, what maybe causes high blood sugars, what doesn't cause your blood sugar to spike. It can help guide your exercise and it can help guide you in medication dosing, especially if you're using insulin and needing to adjust those doses. You also get something called a trend arrow, which uh, shows, if you can see in this little picture, the current blood sugar for this person is 112, that's a good blood sugar, but the trend arrow is pointed up. So that means that it's 112, but the blood sugar is actually increasing a little bit. And so that adds additional information that we just can't get from your glucose meter. There's alerts and alarms for high and low blood glucose. This is, this is really important, especially if you've had a history of low blood sugars or if you're on insulin or one of the sulfonylurea medications that can cause low blood sugars. So these can help protect against low blood sugars. And they provide reports of your overall glycemic trends for your healthcare provider, which I personally love as a provider, but also for you to look at. You can download these reports and see what's been going on with your blood sugars. They can help you pick out problem areas or areas that you want to improve on. Um, it can, and it can show your improvement over time. These are uh, the four available CGM systems currently in the United States. And I won't spend too much time talking about the differences of each of these. Um, there's more information about that in other places in, on the TCO, TCOID website. But briefly, the one on the far left, the Abbott systems, these are great systems, I think, for most people with type 2 diabetes. They're, they're easy to use. They're, they're very accurate. Um, they provide you with all of this continuous glucose monitor information. And these tend to be the ones that are most likely covered by insurance for people with type 2 diabetes. The Dexcom device is another great option. It's a little bit more of a complicated device in some ways in that it adds some extra features, but it's a really good, very accurate CGM. Both the Abbott and the Dexcom device will completely take the place of any finger sticks because you don't have to do finger sticks with your glucose meter to calibrate the, the devices. They come factory calibrated, they're ready to use, you put them on and they're accurate and good to go. The other two devices, the Sensionic device is a tiny implantable device that they just got approval for 180 day wear. So it's a tiny device that's implanted in your arm. You wear it for six months and that's sending continuous glucose monitor data so you don't ever have to change out the sensor every 10 days or anything like that. Um, and then the other is Medtronic. Both of these systems require some calibrations between you know, up to one or two times a day where you still have to poke your finger to calibrate to make sure that they stay accurate. But otherwise, they're running on their own without having to do finger sticks. The big takeaway for CGMs is that currently they're covered mostly for patients with type 2 diabetes who are on basal and bolus insulin. In other words, multiple daily injections of insulin per day. Otherwise, they can be difficult to get covered. So this is a discussion to have with your provider and your insurance company if there's coverage. And we hope over time, um, as we see that these devices really, really help people, even if they're not on insulin, to improve their blood sugar and improve their health, we hope to see them get covered for more and more people. So... In short, uh, there was a lot to cover, a lot of the basics of type 2 diabetes. Uh, we squeeze a lot into 25 minutes. Um, I hope you had fun. I hope you learned something. I do encourage you to go to the TCOID Video Vault and to check out all the videos that we have there for more information on these topics. So if you're interested in CGM, if you're interested in checking, you know, learning more about monitoring your blood sugar, diet, exercise, any of those things, there's specific videos and other information with, that can really help guide you moving forward. So I want to say thank you and stay healthy.